There is that weird thing, isn't there? There's loads of South American and European drivers that have gone to America and been what, moderately successful. But when it comes to American drivers coming over to Europe and doing Formula One, the results are very few and far between. The statistics will show there have been a lot of American drivers to have participated in at least one round of the Formula One World Championship. But those stats are quite skewed, due to the fact that for the first decade or so of the World Championship, the Indy 500 was part of it. So there has been a total of 57 American drivers, of which only two have become World Champion. Phil Hill in 1961 and Mario Andretti in 1978. Although there is a lot of debate as to whether Mario Andretti is Italian, American or Croatian, if you follow modern boundaries. Now, American drivers that have driven in at least one World Championship race, Indy 500 or not, include some names from the American racing royal family. Mario Andretti, Michael Andretti that now wants to have his own Formula 1 team, Skip Barber, Eddie Cheever in the 80s for Arrows, Bob Bondurant who helped pull Jackie Stewart out of his BRM at Spa in 1966, Richie Ginther and Carroll Shelby to name a few. Now, if the one you're thinking of isn't in the list, I haven't forgotten them. Today, the United States is represented by the Haas team, which seems to have times where it punches well above its weight, you know, like having a quick qualifying car in 2016, to being the joke of the field in 2020. As for American drivers, despite a brief appearance from Alex Rossi in 2015, the last American driver to complete a full season was Scott Speed. Now, at the time of this video being made, it looks like Logan Sargent will be the next American driver to be full-time in Formula One. But back in the 1960s, there was another American team, one of the three so-called driver teams of that era. I say so-called, I've literally just made that term up. But what it was, was it was three teams started by racing drivers. There was Brabham, set up by Jack Brabham, McLaren, set up by Bruce McLaren, and the All-American Racers, set up by one Daniel Gurney. Now, if you've not heard of Dan Gurney, that's okay. But Dan Gurney was one of the pivotal characters in American motorsport and was a noted figure in motorsport as a whole. He had a raft of experience and was from a family of bright-minded people. His father, John, graduated from the Harvard Business School with a master's degree, and his three uncles were all engineers educated at the world-renowned Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT as it's more commonly known. So by age 19, Gurney was part of the hot rod culture and even competed on the Bonneville Salt Flats. Eventually, Gurney was racing full-time in motorsport, and in 1957 he was test driving a sports car that even Ken Miles said was undrivable. Carroll Shelby as well for that matter. But despite this, he managed to finish second in that race, beating Carroll Shelby. And this got the attention of Ferrari. By 1959, Gurney was in Formula One. And in 1960, in a BRM, he suffered brake failure at Zandvoort and crashed heavily, the crash killing a young spectator. After this, he'd give the brakes a confidence tap before applying, something you see V8 supercar drivers do all the time to make sure the pads will bite, and developed a braking style that allowed him to nurse the brakes in endurance races, such as at Le Mans, where he would win in 1967 in the Ford GT40. This was also the first time someone had sprayed champagne on a podium. It's now a tradition. Although Jackie Stewart claims he was the first to do it at Clermont-Ferrand in 1969, unless Jackie's saying he was the first to do it in a Formula 1 race, so pff, I don't know, but some of the interesting things about Gurney racing at Le Mans is that the Ford GT40 was 40 inches tall, hence the 40, and Gurney had a very awful time fitting himself into that car. And if you've seen any pictures of Gurney in his 1.5 litre Formula 1 cars from the early 60s, he does look a little bit odd, as he's trying to squeeze himself into those tiny F1 cars of that time. All 6 foot 4 of him. Now I can't think of many racing drivers who were taller, at least since Formula 1 became a world championship in 1950. I can only think of Matt Neal, who is 6 foot 6. For comparison, Justin Wilson was 6 foot 3. Russell and Ocon are 6 foot 1. I don't know. Answers on a postcard, please. Such was the issue that Gurney had to fit into that Ford GT40, they had to make a special bubble in the roof. You might have seen some GT40s from you know, the late 1960s with a small hump in the roof. That was called the Gurney bubble and it was literally there so that Gurney could fit his head and helmet into the car without basically being like this for his entire driving stint. It's like Clarkson being in that hill climb again, you know, this is the best car pause in the world. Or however it went. 
But in 1962, Gurney and Carroll Shelby were discussing the potential of entering a full-up American team into Formula One. The sport was dominated by the British and the Italians. The Garagista teams of BRM, Lotus, Cooper and Brabham, and the Italians basically being just Ferrari with Enzo's power, stature and mythical status as a racing god. Now funnily enough, Gurney was the first driver to be hired by Jack Brabham and he won the team's first race as a two-driver outfit in 1964. With Carroll Shelby's partnership and the backing of Goodyear who were after Firestone's domination of racing at that time, the team became known as the All-American Racers, having its base in Santa Ana, California which is part of Los Angeles. And yes, I'm doing my hardest to not say All-American Rejects right now. The goal with this project was simple, win the Formula 1 World Championship in an American built car. Now would you like some bonus information regarding constructors titles won by a car outside of the UK? Well, that number is currently 17. 16 of those are Ferrari. The 17th, Matra in 1969. The only championship winner to be built outside of the UK or Italy. Quite mental when you think about it. And this is probably also a spoiler. Dan Gurney never won the title in his All-American car. However, when the first All-American racing car was built in 1966, it initially had a small four-cylinder Climax engine that was, for want of a better word, obsolete. It was later replaced by a Westlake V12, and since the car was built in America and the engine being built in Britain, the team was renamed, at least for Formula 1 purposes, the Anglo-American Racers. Now, while the team was officially called the Anglo-American Racers, the car itself was called the Eagle, because America. And actually, Gurney hated the name All-American Racers at first because it sounded too nationalistic. And having looked at pictures for an extended time, probably for the first time with this car, this car has to be one of the most beautiful racing cars ever raced. The front of the car having an almost beak-like design, like an eagle come to think of it, and it's just a very smoothly shaped car with not a lot of unnecessary bits and pieces sticking out, particularly around the engine. Now, two versions of the car were built, one for Formula 1 and one for IndyCar, and time spent building both meant that for all but two races of the Formula 1 season, that is at least for 1966, the team had to run the awful Climax engine. And the relationship with Westlake was due to one of the BRM engineers Gurney knew going to Westlake, and a test engine producing 450 horsepower was so good, Gurney commissioned it for the Eagle car. Now, when the first three cars were built, it had aluminium paneling. But as time went on into 1967, the fourth, Chassis 104, had titanium and later magnesium alloy panels. Now, given last time I was talking about the Honda Time Bomb, that might be a surprise. Now, despite a couple of comments trying to correct me on saying Honda was the first to use magnesium panels, which I never said, Honda wasn't actually the first to do it. Now, what's interesting about this is that the Eagle was using titanium or titanium alloys on this car. And titanium is lighter than aluminium. The problem was, as the CIA, NASA, the USAF and Lockheed had while building the SR-71 Blackbird, is that a lot of the titanium they needed was in the Soviet Union. And there was no way that the Soviet Union, just a few years after we nearly annihilated ourselves with nuclear weapons in 1963, was going to sell titanium to the Americans. Long story short, the CIA set up fake companies to acquire this titanium and Lockheed at the Skunk Works built this Mach 3.5 spy plane. And Gurney actually knew that he was driving a ticking time bomb. One fiery crash and that was it. He actually compared the car to driving a Ronson cigarette lighter. But despite this new lighter car and despite getting the car onto the front row 11 times during the 1967 season, the cars kept breaking down but Gurney would win the 1967 Belgian Grand Prix, which was the first for an American registered car and only one of two times it's actually been done. The other was Roger Penske's car at Austria in 1976. Now it has to be noted here that the Belgian Grand Prix win was done in the titanium magnesium or Timag car, which was introduced at the previous race at Zandvoort. But despite the win at Spa and a podium at most sport in Canada, Gurney would retire from all of the other races. But weirdly, the problems experienced came from supplementary parts of the car. They came from fuel pumps, spark plugs, things like that. Never an actual problem from the engine, as the Westlake V12 turned out to be an absolute tank. In 1969, the car ran again, but the team was running out of money, and the team entered a few races using a McLaren chassis for part of that season. 
It's mad in a way because Bruce McLaren was teammates with Dan Gurney in 1967. McLaren was driving Gurney's car and now Gurney was driving McLaren's car. And it also meant that Gurney drove for all three of those driver teams during the 1960s. Brabham, himself and McLaren, driving for McLaren during 1970. At the end of the 1968 season, the Anglo-American Racers would close up its UK-based team and permanently run itself out of the Santa Ana HQ, where it concentrated itself more on USAC racing, which was America's premier open-wheel series at that time. Now, during this period, the USAC series, of which the Indy 500 was the main event, started to lose money. A lot of money. Promised prize purses never materialised, and the team owners were starting to become more and more upset by the running of the series. And Gurney was the one that everybody turned to for help, because he'd seen how Formula One did things and how it was working in Europe. Then in 1978, Dan Gurney wrote what was called the Gurney White Paper, basically outlining how the series should be run, taking inspiration from how Formula One did things with sponsorship and how Bernie Eccleston was now running the series in terms of the commercial rights and TV revenue and all of that stuff. So once it was all done, a few revisions later, the whole thing became what we now know as Kart, now IndyCar. Dan Gurney is the quiet one of motorsports revolutionaries, at least on this side of the Atlantic. The Gurney flap was a game changer and possibly another video, producing rear downforce with little drag as well as the American built racing car and he's only one of three drivers to win the big four of track racing, that being Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR and sports cars. The other two are Juan Pablo Montoya and Mario Andretti. And Gurney died in 2018, aged 86, but will always be remembered as one of motorsports legends and also producing one of motorsports most beautiful cars. So then a look at Dan Gurney, the Eagle Mark 1 and the All American Racers. If you've learned something new here today then do give the video a thumbs up so the algorithm can do its thing and actually views are up at the minute which is absolutely brilliant. And if you want to see more stuff like this then get subscribed and also get that bell on as well so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Massive shout out to the fab folk at Patreon for the support and if you want to help me buy up images for these videos then you can help out by hitting the link in the description where there's also links to Discord and to my socials. Or if you don't want to do monthly patronage there is the super thanks there if you just want to top up my coffee cup or whatever. So until next time I've been Aidan Mowad, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.